can't hear me, it's, it's, it's not my fault, it's the drugs, it's, uh, it's not doing me any good at the moment. Um, so I'm here to talk about JSR 107. I'm actually going to talk about two things today. Um, I'm going to start with JSR 107, I don't know, maybe about an hour or so, have some time for Q&A at the end. We have a short break, is that correct, Antonio? Yep. We have a short break. Um, I, I guess it's going to be uh, tequila shots and vodka yes. during yes. the break. Yes. And, and after that, I'll talk about data grids um, as a, and JSR 347 as well. Okay. Um, firstly, can you guys all hear me? I mean, the guys way at the back and stuff. Yes? Okay, cool. Shout too much. A little bit about me. Uh, it's all about me, isn't it? My name is Manik Sirtani. I'm, I, I work for, for JBoss, a part of Red Hat, the, the cool part of Red Hat. So you, look at it. <laughs> you guys do interesting things. Um, I'm the founder of InfiniSpan, which is an open source data grid. And for once, I'm not going to talk about InfiniSpan, so um, I'll talk about that later maybe, if you want. Um, I'm on the expert group for JSR 107. I suppose that gives me some authority to talk about JSR 107. And what is that? That's all right. No, thank you. Um, that's pretty cool when the audience offers me a remote control in the middle of my talk. Is, does that happen here a lot in France? <laughs> Champagne. Yeah, Champagne, I don't mind. Remote control, uh, but not as interesting. Thank you very much, though, all the same. Um, I'm also the spec lead in JSR 347, so I'll talk about that a little bit in, in the second talk after the break. So to kind of get things started, um, why do we cache stuff? Right? I mean, I guess everyone knows about caching. Everyone uses it, right? Yes? Hands up? Yeah, okay, good. Um, it's a pretty, pretty, well, you know, well, well thought out, proven technique. It makes things faster. Um, it really helps you scale reads, not writes as much. But that, that's more of a nuance which I'll get into later. Um, caches can be either standalone, very simple caches within a single uh, process or a single JVM in the case of Java, or can be distributed. <coughs> um, there's a fairly significant difference between distributed and standalone caches in that a cache becomes quite useless if, if, if it's not uh, able to communicate with neighboring caches in a distributed system. Um, it's not just distributed systems. You see that on CPUs as well, CPU caches and multi-core or um, SFP sort of architectures. Um, so, so the ability for caches to talk to one another, that's a pretty important one. Um, but yeah, in general, caches are pretty well known. They're, they're used everywhere, like everything from CPUs all the way through to um, High-level applications through to through to the internet, right? things like squid and web caches. So a fairly well-known pattern, um, and quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of the time, we've we've built our own caches. We've built our own homegrown systems uh, to cache things that are expensive to to retrieve or expensive to calculate. Right? Quick show of hands here: Who's actually built their own cache at some point or the other? Is that all? The rest of you are lying. Right? <laughs> I don't believe you. Um, you've used a map, right, to cache stuff? Yes. More hands? Yeah, there you go, right? So I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> um, so caches are pretty, pretty important in, in application development. Uh, lots of other frameworks have, have built-in caches. Java E has not until very recently. Um, pretty much every other application framework or platform for building software has built in a built-in caching framework or caching API, a system that you can use. Um, so anyone who's used any of these, this is just a very brief, uh, non-comprehensive list. A little bit about the history of JSR 107. So this is a fun slide, I always enjoy this one. Um, it, it, we're actually the oldest running JSR, so you know, I guess we win an award or something for that, I'm not sure. Um, there are lots of reasons as to why it's been going on for so long, I'm not going to go into some of the details, it's quite political. But at the end of the day, what's happened is, there's been a lot of change in leadership, a lot of changes in the expert group several times. Um, the API has changed drastically over the last 12 years. Mainly because Java's changed over the last 12 years, but anyway, that's a whole different story. Um, current state of affairs, uh, this is what the expert group looks like. It, it is, uh, it's led by two different groups, by both Software AG and Oracle. Um, and of course, there's several other important companies out there on the on the expert group, including Red Hat, and I'm the I'm the representative there, which is a bit of a hair tearing experience, but it's actually kind of fun. Uh, where are we at the moment? So, brief summary of, of the actual JSR. 
Uh, the draft is submitted, we're very close to completion here, um, awaiting finalization. Um, we kind of hit a bit of a roadblock for the last six to eight months, mainly doing with, to do with legal issues and copyright issues. We're finally through all of that now, and we're still on target for inclusion to Java E7. Now that's pretty important. It's important that we have such an API in Java E. One of the goals for Java E7 is to become a little bit more cloud friendly. Now, uh, who in this room again follows Java E7 quite a lot, the development of Java E7? I was not, not surprised <laughs> about you, but uh, anyway, if anyone else is interested in Java E7 and is following it, one of the goals, uh, at least early on when Java E7 was first announced, was to make it more cloud friendly, right? This was around the time when lots of, I mean, there were more platforms as a service coming up than, than weeds in a garden. Like, all over, everyone had their new PaaS, right? The PaaS is coming up all over the place. Most of them were not Java, Java-based PaaSes. A lot of them were based on Python, on Ruby, and PHP, and something else, right? So we figured there's got to, we've got to kind of get Java modern enough to be, uh, to be useful in the PaaS. And one of the things around that goal was to make it more scalable. And uh, that's where um, JSR 107 comes in. Um, at least for reads anyway, as I mentioned. There were a whole bunch of other things uh, proposed to make Java E more cloud friendly as well. A lot of that's been thrown out now and that's not becoming to go on to Java E 8 and 9 and who knows what else. But uh, as far as Java E 7 is concerned, this is still a useful thing. It's been something that everyone's needed for a long time. Uh, people building applications for quite a long time have still been using um, proprietary caching APIs or their own own caches. So clearly the need is there and it makes sense to put it into the standard. So like I said, why caching? We already discussed that. It's a proven technique. We all like it. We all use it. Um, we tend to use either custom solutions or uh, proprietary, proprietary APIs. So a bunch of existing things out there and I'm sure you've all heard of many of these. Up in that list, there are several more as well, but I uh, just kind of listed a few of the more popular things out there. Uh, Memcached is not specifically Java, but it still is used even in a lot of Java based solutions. Yeah. Um, but I still think the most popular out there is, is still a homegrown, homegrown system. And I want to discuss this a little bit because a lot of people think that's good enough and they're quite happy to, to go with a homegrown solution. Uh, they don't want to include additional jars, additional dependencies in their project. They think a map is usually good enough. Uh, that's <coughs> not the case. Um, a lot of a lot of specifically built caching uh, implementations tend to have a, a far higher degree of concurrency than a typical concurrent hash map, and there are many reasons for this. Um, in addition to that, there are things that you get for free that you don't get in in a map. Things like memory management, the ability to control how much data you actually store in a cache, to be able to expire and evict data. Uh, persistence and preloading, again, very, very useful features if you want to have your application start up and load everything in memory as you start up. Um, transactionality, clusterability, etc. Now, these are all things that you can build yourself. Yes, of course you can. You can add it to, an, to a concurrent hash map quite easily. But there's a quite a lot of complexity and quite a lot of code involved there. Do you really want to be building all this yourself? Do you really want to be, have to maintain and manage all of this yourself? Well, you know, the whole uh, principle of software, of reusing software, you shouldn't really be doing that if there are libraries you can reuse already. So let's have a quick look at API. What does JSR 107 give you? Um, the primary API is very map-like. So um, it kind of has puts, gets, removes, and all of that, but it specifically does not implement Java Util Map or concurrent map. Uh, the reason for this is that the the actual map contract is very. Um, I mean, it's, it's got a lot of methods there that are actually quite useless or quite detrimental to a distributed system. It may work fine in a single VM system, but JSR 107 does not just cover simple standalone caches. It also applies to a distributed cache. And some of those operations get quite expensive in a distributed fashion. Like, for example, when you do a put, uh, what does a map give you when you do a put? Anyone? A quick answer? Map.put, what do you get back? No one? Seriously? You never used a map before? You get the old value back, all right? You get the old value back. All right. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. All right. You get the old value back. Now, that is um, useful in some cases. How many of you actually use that value when you use a cache? Or do you just throw it away? 
most often it's thrown away, right? You don't really look at the old value. Now, that's quite cheap to do in a single VM, if, if you're running a, in a single VM. Uh, retrieving the old value is not a difficult thing to do. But if, if your cache is distributed, that could be quite expensive. It means you need to retrieve the old value from across the network. Or if you're deserializing something off disk, again, that can be quite expensive as well. Potentially for a value that you're never going to use. Potentially for a piece of data you're just going to throw away, right? So um, map.put does not quite work really well for a cache. The same thing with remove as well. Quite often you don't really use the return value of remove. You just want to make sure something got removed, that's all. You just need a boolean perhaps or, you know, some sort of a confirmation that the remove succeeded, not necessarily the old value. In addition to that, other things like um, the, the various iterators you have on map, or the various collections rather, key sets and entry sets and values. Again, you know, okay, easy enough to do if you're running in memory in a single VM. Quite complicated, quite expensive if you're running in a, in a distributed cache, quite expensive if you've persisted to disk and you've got a lot more data on disk than you have memory, things like that. So the actual API looks a bit like this now. Just fire up my ID and actually uh, this is probably easier I think, to show you the Java docs over here. Um, so you still have things like Actually, let's go and have a look at put. Yeah, so the contract for put. Can you guys see this? Is this clear? Yeah? So um, back there as well, you've got the screens there. So the contract for put actually does not return anything. Basically, if, if the put succeeds, that method call, that invocation is going to succeed. If, um, if, if the put fails, you're going to get an exception. It's going to throw an exception. Um, and basically, you don't get the old value back. Right? That makes it a lot cheaper. So you don't have a way to provide some hints? There's no open up of the API so that the provider had you know specific extensions to do things one way or the other. Um, in the sense that to return the old value? No, like a put key value and let's say a map providing hints. You know. What specific hints are you referring to? Uh, let's say you want it asynchronous. Or right. Yeah. Those are things that that JSI 107 does not provide for, and that I'll get into that in a second. Um, actually, uh, the, the reason why the reason why JSI 107 does not provide any such hints is. Um, those hints are really quite useful for, for distributed cache only. Um, it's quite useless otherwise. So a lot of that actually goes into JSR 347, which, which is specifically distributed. And, and you have a lot of extra APIs. Um, also, it, it becomes more type safe to actually have specific asynchronous methods as opposed to just a hint, and then that, that could, you know, you don't know how it's going to behave. Why exceptions? Why not rule? I'm sorry? Yes, I can get into that. There's a very long email thread around that. I, I was actually voting for booleans, but anyway. Um, yeah, so similarly, remove as well. Remove does return a boolean. Now, this is the other weird part. This actually doesn't. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but to go back to what, what a map does, we actually do have very map-like methods as well. Things like get and remove. This will actually return you the old value. So get and remove over here is a bit like remove in a map. Right? And similarly, uh, get and put, again, is like you know, get the old value and store this new value. Again, behaves like put on a map. So that's your basic API over there. That's kind of where it stands at the moment. Um, let's have a look at... <laughs> what is the difference between get and replace and put? Oh, get doesn't, put doesn't give you the same thing that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. A put just returns void. It doesn't actually return the old value. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Yes, I, I should realize you guys can't hear it. Uh, the question here was, what's the difference between between get and put and put? Um, get and replace. Uh, get, get and replace, rather, and put. <coughs> and the difference is that is that just doing a put does not return you the old value, whereas uh, get and replace will still return you the old value. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, persistence. Now, this, this is a fairly useful feature for JSR 107. This is the ability to, to write through to disk um, or any sort of persistent storage, not necessarily disk. So, um, uh, writing through and to be able to read from it as well. Right? This gives you the ability to do uh, preloads and warm starts. So, if you want to restart your system, you can preload your cache, preload everything into memory. Um, it also helps in that 
you can also configure a JSR 107 cache to um, to spill over onto disk. So once you run out of memory, or once you hit a predefined limit as to how much you how much data you want to store in memory, you can then start offloading data onto disk using using this SPI. Um, now now this is pluggable. I, I believe there will um, each implementation will ship with. Um, with various implementations of cache loader and cache writer. You can also write your own and plug it in. Um, and this, this makes it quite flexible. You can write things to your own specific format on disk, which you can then do other things with as well. So if you have a quick look at those two uh, interfaces. <coughs> so that's what cache loader looks like. Very, very simple. Uh, SBI over there, you just got a load and a load all, um, and and various various implementations of JSR 107 would typically have uh, additional methods as well. Um, this is just a very this is like a bare minimum your your uh, your subset of uh, what's needed across across all implementations. Like for example, as an example, um, InfiniSpan actually has a load all with. Uh, with, with um, instead of just having a set of keys that you want to load, just a number of entries that you might want to load up. So you don't really care which entries, you just have to have a predefined number that you want to load into memory to start with. So that's your cache loader, very simple uh, SBI. Cache writer similarly does the same thing in the reverse direction, um, where you get to store data or remove data from, from the persistent store as well. So you've got write methods, you've got delete methods as well. Any, any questions on this so far? Cool. So, the next thing, events. Um, another useful feature of JSR 107 is to be able to register, uh, register for events, um, uh, to be notified when things happen in your cache. Typically things like data being changed, data being removed, or even data being created and added. Um, we also have the ability to, to register filters on, on your, on your um, listeners. So you can only listen for certain types of, uh, or specific keys rather, rather than anything or everything that changes. Um, events can also be synchronous or asynchronous. This means it can happen in the same application thread that makes the change, or in a separate thread. Um, if you're doing things in a synchronous manner, it is kind of important to remember that your listener is being invoked in the same application thread. Your app, the application that's making the change is actually waiting for your listener to, to be invoked. So whatever you do there, please make sure you don't, uh, I don't know, long thread dot sleeps or I don't know, random things like that. They just take a long time and hold up your application. So let's have a quick look at the listeners here. Uh, it's, in, it's in there. So this is your super interface, basically that that all uh, the other listeners, all the other listeners uh, extend. It's just a marker interface here. Um, so when you create a listener, you'd either actually implement uh, one of these: either cache entry created listener, cache entry updated listener, read, removed, expired. They do exactly what the name says. Uh, they'll provide a callback whenever one of those events happen. Let's have a look at this one: uh, cache entry created, for example where you get a notification, you get a callback saying that this entry was created. Um, you actually get a series, you, you could get a series of, of entries there. For example, if you're using a put all or something like that, you're creating a number of entries in one go. Similarly for entries that are being read, you can get this callback over here. Um, and, and your implementation can implement <coughs> multiple interfaces, so you get multiple callbacks. And you can uh, you can deal with that. Let's have a quick look at the actual event that you get. So the event that you see in the callback um, essentially has got the key that's been changed. You've got the old value. You can get the source. The source is a reference to the actual cache itself. Um, the new value, the the value that's been updated after the event. And you have this flag over here, this, this uh, when the old value is available, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what that means in just a second. Um, essentially, when you register, when you register um, an, a listener on the cache, 
you get to specify whether you're interested in your value at that time. Now, um, depending on what you're actually trying to do in your, in your listener, you may not need the old value. So specifying that you don't need the old value actually makes that uh, event a little bit cheaper when we actually dispatch to it. So this is what you see in the, uh, in the actual registration. So we, we store things like um, any filters that you've created. Um, the filters basically is a very simple interface again to tell you which, which uh, keys you're interested in. So when you, when you provide a filter, you can say only invoke this listener when, uh, uh, when, when the event affects these particular keys. If not, don't bother. register one of these. So the registration method is actually on the cache itself. There it is. There's a method there called register cache entry listener. Uh, you pass in the, your listener implementation which will implement one or more of those uh, listener interfaces. You optionally pass in actually let's go down to that. There you go. One or more of those uh, interfaces I said. You um, you pass in this flag whether you require the old value or not. If you set that to false, then your um, any events passed back to your to your listener is not going to have the old value. You can't actually see what the old value was. You can pass in a filter. The filter is optional. If you pass in a null, you're going to be notified of changes to any key. Um, if you have a filter, only keys that match that filter um, you can be notified of. And of course, whether your listener is synchronous or asynchronous. Right? So, fairly, fairly straightforward there. Um, any questions around that? No? Question in the back? Okay, so question at the back was, where is the filter actually running in a distributed system? Now, um, keep in mind that the JSR, uh, JSR 107 does not specify that your, that your cache has to be distributed. So as a result, it does not actually specify where the filter runs as well. Um, that becomes an implementation detail. Um, yeah, so, so different, different implementations, they either run it on the caller side or, or in a distributed fashion as well. Um, personally, it would make sense to run the filter remotely as well, so you don't actually move too much data around. But yeah, that, that, that is an implementation detail. The spec does not specify that. The next section I want to cover is annotations. Now, this is a fairly new part of, of the JSR in that, um, like I said, the JSR is 12 years old, so um, it's kind of evolved quite a bit over time. Uh, Annotations are a fairly new part of the JSR. Um, it essentially makes things a lot easier to consume a JSR 107 cache. Right. Um, I mean, the, the pattern of caching is quite well known, but there's a lot of boilerplate around it. Every time you use a cache, you have to say, for example, you're retrieving something expensive from a database. What would you do? You typically check the cache, see if the data is there. If it's not there, you go and get it from the database, and then put it back in the cache, and then use it, and then so on and so forth. Right. So that's a fairly well-known cycle, um, a fairly well-known pattern. We do it all the time. Um, a lot of boilerplate around that. So with some of these annotations that we've included, it makes things a lot easier in that you don't have to do any of that. All of that is done by the caching provider. As long as you annotate a method as a producer of data and where to cache its result, you just invoke that method. Now, the annotations that we've created are um, um, agnostic to any particular injection framework. It can be used with CDI, with Spring, with Juice. Um, so CDI, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing everyone's familiar with CDI here? Yeah. yeah, good. So CDI being a part of Java EE, being a part of Java EE 6 and 7 as well, and the preferred programming model for Java EE, if you will. Uh, so, so yeah, this makes it very easy to consume a JSR 107 cache from CDI. So let's have a look at what that looks like. Um, Before I do this, let me actually show you some of the 
So this, uh, what I'm going to show you here, the code I'm going to show you here is in the, uh, is actually a part of the TCK. It's a part of the JSR 107 TCK uh, testing for annotations and how they work. So this, uh, for example, this this class here that does some stuff. Um, what this annotation basically means, if you annotate a method that says cache result, every time that method gets invoked, the result of that method, this one up here, uh, get, um, get entry create, get entry cached. Every time that is invoked, the result of that method uh, gets stored in the cache, right? And you can specify the name of the cache you want to use. You can specify a whole bunch of other things. For example, um, what you want to use as a key for that entry, and so on and so forth. By default, the uh, the parameter used becomes the key for the, for, the, for that result. In this case, basically, every time that method's invoked, um, anything with that key title up there gets removed from the cache, as the name suggests. In this case, this empties that cache because it's empty with cache removal. And this one's a bit more interesting over here. Here we cache the results of of that um, of uh, that method. Except over here, we are only going to use. Uh, let's see if you can see the whole thing. We are only going to use this second parameter as your key, as opposed to um, all of these parameters. Let me actually make that a bit more readable. Yeah. So by default. Um, if you only have one parameter to that method, that parameter becomes the key that that uh, the result is cached under. If you have more than one parameter, basically the, the parameters are concatenated together, they're joined together to, fo to form a composite key, and that's the default as well, unless you decide to specify using add cache key parameter which of those parameters you want to use. Um, in this case, uh, since I've specified the second parameter as my cache key. The first and the third parameter are ignored uh, when it comes to storing that value. Is it using equals? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, sorry, the question was, does it use object on equals to compare the uh, parameters? The answer is yes. Well, actually, the answer is uh, um, cache provider dependent, but I'd be surprised if anyone does not use object on equals in that case. Maybe. Now here's another example where I can um, specify some of the defaults um, on the class level over here. So for example, I can say for this entire class, always use cache name equals something. So I don't have to specify that on a per method basis. Now on a per method basis, I can just say cache the results of this. And the defaults are going to be used. Uh, the default cache name was already provided on the class. The default key for that is already provided. Same thing for remove entry, remove all, etc. And how do you create the cache? Because you give it a name, but if you have several ones, how do you create a cache? Yes, yeah, so I'll get into that in a second. I'll show you some code around that as well. Uh, the question was, how do you actually create the cache? Um, but yeah, I'll get into that in just a bit. Well, let's have a quick look at this, it's probably easier. So you can provide a bunch of other, uh, a bunch of other attributes to your cache result annotation. For example, you could say, um, you can specify whether you cache the result if an exception is thrown. You might, uh, based on your logic, um, if an exception is thrown, you actually don't want to cache anything there. Um, but in some cases, you might actually want to cache the fact that there was an exception. So you can actually specify that. Um, whether your result is a null or not, you might decide that if the result is a null, it's actually invalid, don't bother caching the result. But in some cases, that might be a valid thing. You might want to actually store that uh, and save the result that was a null. So that repeated invocations, you don't have to go through the logic in there. 
You can provide a resolver factory. Now this actually answers uh, Antonio's question here as to how do you actually create your cache. The cache resolver factory actually um, instructs, um, uh, has the logic as to how do you actually locate that cache using the cache manager. Um, and you can actually have the logic in there again to build a new cache if you haven't got one already. You might decide to store exceptions in a different cache as well. You can provide a separate cache name for exceptions, for exceptional situations. Um, and you may also provide, for example, a skip get attribute to, to not to bother to consult, to consult the cache in that particular case, um, to just execute the result of that and store the value in the cache. So you might have some methods where you, you don't actually want to consult what's in the cache already. You just want to overwrite it regardless. Um, the, the cache key generator, this again uh, lets you provide some logic as to how you generate the, that composite key. By default, I believe it's, um, it's, it's a collection of sorts that they use a collection of all of these entries and all of these parameters. But you might have some other logic to, to be able to provide a composite key, in which case you can provide your own cache key generator over there. So like I said, this makes things a lot easier to, to, uh, to use, especially if you are running in an environment like, like Spring or CDI or Juice, where um, most of your beans are going to be wired by your injection framework anyway. Um, you're going to have interceptors around your, your code anyway, and you can make use of all of that to, um, yeah, to take care of the caching as well. Does it say that it should work out of the box for CDI, or yes. it's undefined? No, it is supposed to work out of the box for CDI, Spring, and Juice. Those are the three that, uh, uh, they're, they're part of the TCK, all three. <coughs> Any other questions on, uh, on annotations so far? Okay. Cool. Moving swiftly on then. <laughs> Um, this is one part of the uh, spec that I'm actually not particularly happy about and not particularly proud of, but anyway. Uh, the fact that there are actual op they're actually optional elements to a spec. Personally, I think that's ridiculous. Um, if you have a spec, why are parts of it optional? But uh, anyway, there are two optional parts to the spec. The first one is transactions, and the second one is uh, the distributed nature of, of, the, uh, of, of the implementation. So not all JSR 107 providers, like I said, need to implement these two, they're optional. Um, transactions, there's basically a, there's a capabilities um, API as a part of the spec, which lets you know what your implementation can and can't do. There you go. There's an enumeration here with optional features, and that tells you uh, what your provider can and can't deal with. Um, and that basically pushes the, the onus on to you, the application developer, is to decide whether you can or can't use transactions with a particular provider, for example. I think that's uh, quite poor, but anyway. The other... Um, yeah, so anyway. Um, the second part, the fact that it's distributed, that actually does not affect API very much because your API shouldn't really change whether your, whether your cache is distributed or not. But it does affect the way you use a cache, unfortunately. It affects your, your decisions around how you use your cache. Um, like I said, certain operations are very cheap if you're running in a single VM. They're not very cheap if they're distributed. Um, I mean, we do actually have some iterators on the cache API, and I'd strongly recommend not using those iterators if you're running in a distributed fashion. Because that, uh, that can cause all sorts of problems. So just kind of sum things up, um, kind of demonstrate the API. It's a fairly simple API, but at the same time quite flexible and powerful, especially with the annotation support. I think that's, that's one of the major advances we've had quite recently. Um, it makes things a lot more usable. Um, it, will be, it's, it will be a part of Java EE. It's still on schedule. Um, so it removes the need to, to include specific libraries in your application. As long as you're running in a Java E7 environment, you're going to get uh, all of these capabilities. And we're finally getting somewhere with it, completing it. So, yeah. We're trying not to have it run to 13 years. Bad luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if we get stuck there, who knows how long it's going to take. A few um, URLs to leave you guys with. So everything's up on GitHub if you want to have a look at the spec. 
um, the TCK, the reference, reference implementations up there as well, and um, and uh, this, the demo, the demo um, package isn't quite complete yet, but there are a few demos up there, there'll be a few more going up, so you can actually see it in action. Uh, if you're interested in actually learning about uh, the process of what's actually gone on, um, as of maybe as of maybe two two something years ago, we moved all of our mailing lists into the public, so it's all on Google Groups. So you can go and have a look. Anyone who's interested can can. Um, I don't think you're allowed to post on it, but you can actually at least see what's been going on. So, yeah. With that, any questions? I know that uh, Kirk is itching to ask a question here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, do you see any uh, major changes? Um, with uh, lambdas coming into play, like for instance, uh, you would expect that the iterators would get turned outside in um, with uh, lambdas, and that might alleviate some of the distributed performance concerns. Yes, I absolutely think so, but unfortunately, um, that's not going to happen. JSR one hundred seven. Um, I know that we are doing. We are definitely doing that for JSR three hundred forty seven, where. Uh, it's, it's really, JSR 3.7 is an extension on 107, just so you guys know. It's an extension that um, has the assumption that everything will be distributed, um, and a few other things as well, but primarily will be distributed, and um, things like lambdas, again, are supported there. The initial plan for JSR 3.47 was to have um, a more explicit MapReduce style API, but we're moving towards the lambda style API now, as per yeah, Java 8. It just makes more sense to do that. Any integration with other specs on Java EE? I'm, I'm always uh, thinking of the second level cache of JPA. Yes, um, there have been some discussions around that, but again, nothing, nothing close to. Yeah. Question here. Yeah. 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 I'm first. Um, <coughs> do Do you already know uh, which main framework will be uh, compatible with that uh, API? With 107. Yeah. Um, like I said, when I had a slide up earlier as to who's on the expert group, uh, pretty much everyone on that expert group is working towards an implementation. <coughs> so yeah, um, as for when, I have no idea, but but they're all going to get there at some point. And it's a part, it's going to be a part of Java E seven as well. So it means that every E seven vendor will have some implementation that is compliant. Even IBM. Even IBM. <laughs> <laughs> there IBM no. <laughs> Uh, can you comment on your um, um, if you've seen like uh, greater use of slab allocators in the uh, in, in some of these implementations? I, I can't comment on many of the other implementations. I'm not privy to uh, to what goes on there. Um, but, but it's something we've been experimenting with. Um, we don't actually do that right now in Infinispan, but yeah, it, it is it is an interesting area to play around with. What is the ERI by the, by the way? ERI. Uh, reference implementation. Oh, the RI. Um, <laughs> the reason I said this, RI is, a, is another JBoss project which has to do with web UIs. And I was like, how's that related? But anyway, uh, no. The the reference implementation is is completely new. It's ground up. Um, it's an Apache licensed uh, um, implementation built by built by Oracle. So it's not EH cache. It's not it's regular. Not EH cache. Oh. No, no. Yes. Despite um, despite well, common misconception, no, it's not. It is a complete ground up, um, yeah, a complete ground up implementation written by Oracle. Any other questions? I actually have one about the, you know, the several caching. Uh, you showed a name, so it looks like I will be able to cache things in different caches. Yes. So the question I, I asked was, how do you create those caches? Because um, in Java E6 and more and more in Java E7, what we're doing is you have a, uh, an annotation. So I'm thinking of data source uh, uh, definition. I'm thinking of uh, JMS factory definition. I'm thinking of JMS uh, destination, I think. And what you do is you have an annotation, you put the name of what you want, the data source, blah, 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 deploy it, bang. Is it something like that, or will it be something like that? If I have, if I want five <coughs> caches, I would like to, you know, make it easy, not have a lot of admin stuff. Yeah, I mean that, that's where the resolver factories come in. So the resolver factory can then delegate to anything else. Um, so you could potentially have that style of of construction. 
Um, so, but, but you don't have a you don't have a cache uh, definition, mm -hmm. an annotation where you put the name, any algorithm, maybe timeout stuff like that. We do have we do have uh, vendor extensions for that. Like InfiniSpan does do that um, with CDI specifically. Uh, we've got a, a cache producer annotation, but but that's not in the spec. Um, the reason why that's not in the spec um, is is because we want the annotations to be. Uh, portable across different DI frameworks and having that work get across Juice and Spring and CDI meant that you had to lose a certain amount of that functionality. Any other questions? Up here? One there. One up here. <clears throat> Do you have um, several policies on how to expire stuff from the cache? What do you mean by policy? I mean, like maybe it's like a time based or a number based if you reach yes. a certain threshold or something. Yes, you can, but that's not uh, specified in the spec. So that becomes a vendor extension. Where you, um, the only thing that the spec does does define is that there is, an, there is the ability to expire data. Now, what those triggers are, that, that is how you configure a particular implementation. Uh, it's almost like more question for Antonio, but uh, yeah. Um, I've just seen any discussion around caching web fragments, because caching method results is quite interesting, but caching whole web fragments where things are not moving might be you know, even more interesting in some areas. Uh, to be honest, uh, we voted for 107 a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> so we said, yes, let's have it on Java E7. And actually, I had to uh, email Greg, because even on the EE7 expert group, we thought uh, there was an email about, let's vote for WebSockets and, God, what, and the JSON P. And I went, and what about Jcash? I thought it was nearly ready. So I had to contact Greg, who replied, yes, we are ready. You know, there was uh, some issues, some legal issues, but we are ready. So we put that into voting a few weeks ago, so we haven't talked about caching at all in E7. That's why I was asking if you guys had worked with the JPA 2.1 expert group, but no, I so mean, it's completely new in E7, and I think they will have no integration at all. I, I don't think so at all at this stage, no. Um, we did start some discussions several months ago, but they got stalled because we got stuck in legal hell between, uh, um, yeah, between Oracle and Software AG, so. Anybody from Software AG? <laughs> <laughs> no more questions? Okay, well, it looks like we have some giveaways because Christmas is coming. And we have a few questions. Bonsoir.